last spring, this fall, some of our school systems have also been involved deeply in, in service programs with the William Glasser, Laverne College Center, and the Educator Training Center. Dr. Glasser is well known for being a humane, loving person. His books that you know best are Schools Without Failure and Reality Therapy. His new one is now out. And for those of you in education, Dr. Glasser is not an EDD, a DA, or a PhD. Dr. Glasser is an MD and also a registered psychiatrist. So without any further ado, because he has to catch Treetop Airlines again about 11.45, I give you Dr. William Glasser. Yep. Thank you very much. I want to take the, the time this morning to discuss some of the things we've been doing and some of the ideas I've had as I work and try to work with various schools to try to get them to listen to some of the things that I've been I've been trying to trying to put into practice the last several years. My uh, my original contact with schools was with a school for delinquent girls at Ventura, California, California Authority Reformatory, called the Ventura School for Girls. This is not to be confused if some of you have seen our programs on TV with the Ventura Elementary School in Palo Alto. These are two separate places. They just happen to have the same name. I, I can't figure why this coincidence occurred. I tried to get the superintendent of Palo Alto to change the name of that elementary school. Well, they said it's going to cause all kinds of confusion, but uh, he couldn't do it. So I worked for a long time with a school for older adolescent delinquent girls. And if you see the TV thing, you see little kids running around on the screen. It's not the same place. We don't have delinquents that young in California. Well, I worked at the, uh, at the girls' school, which was, of course, had a school attached to it. I used to talk to the girls and try to find out what was, what was bothering them and how we could help them and ask them what we were doing at the school that, was, that they thought was worthwhile. And the girls often said that uh, they liked the place. Uh, they weren't wild about being locked up in a reformatory, but many of them had a lot of experience being locked up. And they said, if you had to be locked up, this was a good place to be locked up. And uh, I said, why? And they said, well, I think that staff people care for us here. We're treated, treated well. We're treated humanely. And there's a good school. I had little to do with the school part. I was more concerned with the cottage living program, the psychiatric program. But I used to ask, well, what's good about our school? I hadn't noticed anything particularly good or bad about it. I hadn't paid much attention to it. And they said, well, what's good about the school here at this place is that we don't fail. Well, it didn't register very strongly on me. It took a long time for that message to come through because it had never occurred to any of us to fail anybody in reform school. This is not, this is not the school you fail. You know, you don't flunk reform school. Goodness gracious, you failed into our school, not out of it. And so, uh, I thought for a long time about this, though, and I used to talk to them more, and I'd say, "Did you fail in public school?" And they said they did. And I said, well, it's probably because you were, you know, bad students. You goofed off and did all kinds of horrible things. And they claimed that's true. They did. They didn't deny it. The girls weren't going to, you know, gild the lily about their, their behavior in school. But nevertheless, they said had they, when they failed in school, that it was bad because it, 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 it made them give up. And they said, when you're young and you're not making it in school, you're failing and you're cutting school and you're getting into trouble in school, it's easy to get into trouble outside of school. And I think this is a, a pretty established fact, that school is a very important place, and kids who aren't making it can get into a lot of trouble. It's not that every delinquent kid, uh, it's not that every school failure becomes delinquent, but just about every delinquent child has had serious failure in school. And if we're going to help kids to stay where they should be, then school failure is an important thing to concern ourselves with. Well, that may not concern you in this audience you don't work with, with delinquents to, to the extent that, uh, that I did, at least uh, certified delinquents. You may work with a lot of them, but they haven't quite been certified that way yet. But the point that the girls were making was that uh, they said, once you fail in school, you begin to look at yourself as a failure. And I think this is probably a, a point to consider very strongly. I didn't consider it so strongly 10, 11 years ago, but as, the, as I've thought about this over the last several years, 
I think that probably if there's a psychological clue to how we get along in the world, you and I and the delinquent girls and the kids in your school and everybody else, we get along in the world, I think, pretty much the way we look at ourselves. If we view ourselves as someone who is successful, I like to use the term success and failure. I think that's really how we view ourselves. If we view ourselves as successful, as someone who has friends and has people that care for him, as someone who is doing something with his life that is relatively worthwhile, that we have some belief in is worthwhile, then we continue to live this kind of a life. We continue to make friends, to have confidence in ourselves, to be able to take setbacks and obstacles without giving up, and to, do, to continue to try to do things worthwhile. But the overall viewpoint is that this is the way I am. My opinion of myself, my self-image, my whatever you want to call it, self-image or identity or role or any of these things, these are, these are critical. Critical that we view ourselves as successful. Now, most people in this room at this time would view yourself this way. I'm, not, I'm pretty sure we haven't always viewed ourselves this way. I'm sure every one of us has experienced failure. But most of us have been able to overcome whatever obstacles in our path. And right now, if we had to sum our life up in terms of just saying, someone said to you, are you a success or failure? Most people in this room would say, right now I'm successful. You might modify that statement and say, I could be more successful or something to that effect. But if I had to say, look, you're either a success or failure, which are you? And I think that's generally how our brain does it, that we sum everything up and we view ourselves either being successful or failing. Most people here would say they're successful. The girls at the Ventura School, the delinquent girls, if they were asked this question, and I asked it to them on many occasions, they would say, at least when they entered the school, that they were a failure. And that everything they seem to do confirmed that. Because it seems that we almost have to be the person that we view ourselves as. And if we view ourselves as a failure, that's the kind of person we, we, we're going to be. We'll, we'll kind of lead that kind of life. And if you've ever worked, and I'm sure most of you have, a little kid who's doing badly at school, and you've wondered, why in the world can't I help this kid? Everything we plan, everything we do... Every program we lay out, somehow or other, he doesn't make it. You finally say to yourself, you know, he's working at this. It's not that he's haphazardly just uh, goofing up, but this, this, this kid is working at failure. And that's really what people do. They just don't haphazardly fail. They make an effort to fail. And that's what makes it so hard to help them. If they view themselves this way, then this is how they live their life. So, as I worked with the girls, it became very important for us in the school we ran, this delinquent girls' school, it became important for us to say, how can we help these kids to feel successful? And obviously, the school program was vital. But they said they didn't fail. This was very, very important. They began to work a little bit in school. They began to feel I can do it in school. They were dealt with in their cottages as, as, as human beings, and they were given responsibilities and things they could do. And many of them, by the time they had spent six or eight months in our school, left with the feeling, I can make it. Not many of them actually were able to go back into public school, though. Very, very few of our girls could go back into a public school and continue to succeed. We had reports back over and over again that they could leave our place and go to work, but their chances of going back to school were very slim. And I used to talk to girls. I used to write to them, and some girls would come back and visit. And I'd say, well, how come you can't make it in public school? You made it here. And they'd say, well, Dr. Glasser, when we get back there, they ask us where we've been, and they view us as a failure. And they, and they give us an ultimatum. They say, one false move, and boy, you're going to be out of here again. And they say, what do we do? We never even leave the office at that point. We make the false move right then and there. Because you can't challenge people who've had a lot of failure. They rise to the bait, and they, and they confirm their failure, and they're out. So it was the rare girl that could gain enough strength to make it in the public school because the public schools are very oriented toward success and failure, and our girls were by their, their label put into the failure category. And this is a problem we could never overcome, and I concern myself about this. Why, why did the schools, why didn't the schools give these kids a chance? It wouldn't have hurt to do this. Why did they have them labeled? And then the kids again would confirm that label by their behavior. Well, I never did solve this problem to any great extent, but I had a chance later on to, people heard about some of the work I'd done, and 
wrote the book Reality Therapy, which advertised I could do some good with children and things like that. So I got a chance to work in a public school, which was a revelation to me. I had never, never done this before in the sense I was being asked to now. Little school district with evidently a lot of upset kids, and they didn't exactly tell me what they wanted me for. They just said, will you come and help us? And I said, well, fine. And I, I was optimistic that I could do something. I'm always optimistic that it's something that's part of my nature. And so I went in there, and people were cordial to me. We had opening amenities after I signed the contract, went there. There was a lot of cordiality, probably 15 or 20 seconds worth of shaking hands and, and saying, glad you're here. And next thing they did is they said, well, now we'd like you to go to work. Are you ready? And I said, yeah, I'm ready. So they, they, they put me in a room with a little kid, a little nasty kid, about a room maybe not much bigger than this podium, just me and this nasty kid sitting in this room. And he's looking at me with his little beady eyes, you know, and he's wondering what I'm going to do to him. You know, they got someone strange here now, and he's worried and kind of kind of uh, hostile. And I'm very worried sitting in that room with him because uh, I could see that that uh, there was nothing I could do with this kid. I don't know what. Evidently, they had the feeling that a psychiatrist sits in rooms with kids and kids go in bad and come out good or something like that. And... Uh, <laughs> It may be true for some psychiatrists, but I've never had that kind of luck. So I, I did. I opened the door of the room, and I said to the kid, you know where you came from? And he said, yeah, yeah. I said, well, you go on back there. And so I sent him on back to where he came from. Because uh, I sure as hell wasn't going to sit there with him. I probably, I probably had about three minutes, you know, and uh, conversation was limited, and I could see it wasn't going to go anywhere. So I don't know how many of you are in this guidance counseling business and have had I'm sure many of that same that same experience that someone says now I'm going to send you this kid and you know what the hell to do with him well <laughs> I didn't know what to do with him either but I knew one thing that whatever I did with him I wasn't going to do it any better because I did it longer so I I, uh, <laughs> I just sent him back that's all and people there were disappointed because they haven't had a whole line of kids waiting to see me <laughs> actually in the in the beginning, they were happy because they thought, wow, I'd done it all in 30 seconds or so or minutes <laughs> that I really could help them out. But I, I told them, no, I said, I'm not going to sit in the room with any more kids. I asked them, they have a lot of children like this. And they said, yeah, oh, yeah, we got lots of them, lots of them. And I became concerned. Uh, I had, you know, I'd worked with uh, r relatively tough delinquent girls, so-called, but I had never seen anything like these little kids, you know. And so uh, I said at that point, I remember this was first back in 1965 in the fall. I said, well, I'd like to resign right now. I don't want to be the consultant here anymore because uh, I said, uh, uh, I don't think I can do you any good. And I was frank. I said, I think I'll ruin my reputation here in this place. <laughs> <laughs> and they were disappointed. You know, they, they said, uh, gee whiz, uh, what do you mean? You know, aren't you going to do your thing? And I said, no, I, I don't have anything I can do. And they said, well, don't you, don't you adjust? Little kids are out of adjustment. <laughs> I said, no, I can't even find the dials, to tell you the truth. <laughs> so anyway, we talked things over, and they asked me, would I still hang around to do... They asked me, could I do anything? I said, yeah, I can, I can do some things, but I can't do these things. And so, so they asked me, what could I do? And I said, I can give you some advice. Well, whenever you say that, that really calms things down. That's like throwing oil on troubled waters, because... When you say you can give advice, and everybody knows that this is great, you know, you can chat and be comfortable, and nothing at all is going to happen. You know, that's, that's the good part about giving advice. It means that nothing's going to happen at all. And so everything calms down, and I could see that, you know, things were going to be okay. So they said, what advice do you have? And so I, I reiterated, do you really have a lot of children like this kid? And they, oh, yeah. And they said, we got lots of them. Probably 20% of the kids in this school are upset. So I said, well, my advice is, I said, to stop irritating the kids. Now, that advice didn't fall on receptive ears, I can tell you that. Because school people don't really look at that what they're doing is irritating the kids. They just said, we're just running school. And I said, well, maybe there's a correlation, but I just muttered that under my breath. I didn't want to upset anybody. But the point here is that uh, I said to them, you got a lot of upset kids, right? And they said, I said, well... I said, probably you're th so there are some things that you're doing that's irritating to the children. And I said, you ought to stop it. I said, not, not stop it, really, because I don't, I don't want to cast myself as a bleeding heart for little children or anything like that. Uh, I, said, I said, actually, I like to irritate them as much as the next man. But the point is, I said, 
when I irritate a kid, I only do it if I know I can get away from him. I said, you see, when you're running school and you irritate him and you can't leave him, that's a foolish move. The whole, the whole purpose of irritating another human being is to get rid of him. That's the whole purpose of it. If you got a bad marriage, you irritate, 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 till finally your wife or husband leaves, that's all, and, and, and that's the purpose of the operation. But, but you see, in, in school you can't do that so, uh, because you, you need the job ordinarily. And, uh, and the kids, they're going to come and go, but you're going to stay there. So, so then the people started listening more, and they said, well, what are we doing that's irritating the children? And I said, well, I said, you're failing them. I remembered what my girls at Ventura had said. I said, you're failing them. They said, well, of course we're failing them. Said, of course we're failing them. Why, every one of those kids is failing. And uh, I said, well, I say, I think you ought to stop it. And, and this, this is a hard concept. I mean, this is, this is a difficult concept. I remember, I remember talking in Nebraska several, several years ago to the Nebraska Teachers Association, one of their meetings, large group. And uh, there was a Nebraska, a Nebraska television commentator, someone that evidently goes on the stations on the TV in Nebraska. And he was listening to what I had to say. And he went on the television after I said, you ought to stop failing the kids. Really hot and bothered about that. And he said, a uh, man came from California and said we should stop failing kids in Nebraska and instead give them all A's. Now, I didn't say that. I just said stop failing them. The all A, that was his interpretation. And uh, uh, that's not what I'm trying to say. I realize that television, one of the few industries that, you know, that, that, that employs the retarded, so you can't expect an awful lot <laughs> from, uh, from uh, this place. But hell, someone's got to give those people a chance, and I'm glad that the television does. But, but when I say to people, when I say don't fail children in school, I don't mean give them all A's. I don't mean give them credit for anything they haven't learned or work they haven't done or something for nothing, which is one of the, one of the great fears when you say you don't fail children. All I said was that if you're going to try to run a humane school, if you're going to try to motivate children to learn, if you're going to try to create a, an environment within your school that, that's going to be good for education that you can't do it against a background of failure and that every one of these upset kids was failing in school which was absolutely true and I said stop it but that's all I said and that's all I still say I wrote a book called schools without failure the book was not called schools with all success I wish I could have written that book but that'd be a much harder book to write schools without failure is not a hard book to write because that's a minimal a minimal and first step but a necessary step if you're failing kids in your school, then with those kids you don't have much of a chance to do anything worthwhile with them. And further than that, you will give them a large bit of evidence. I mean, when we're evaluating ourselves, like I said, the delinquent girls came up with the idea they're failures. You in this room, for the most part, will come up with the idea you're successful. You don't get that idea uh, from nowhere. You get it from evidence that comes in. And if you're a little kid, who doesn't have much power, and you're in a powerful school, and your parents are yelling, you need that school, and the whole world says you need education, you go there and you fail. The evidence that you're not worth very much is pretty strong. The problem is, and many people with meant well, I suppose, over the years, and failure, as I'll explain in a moment, did have a place at one time in education, I suppose it did. Not a good place, but at least at a reasonable place, you can understand its purpose. That if you're going to, uh, 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 that if you're going to, if you want children to succeed in school, you can't label them a failure because this becomes part of the way they look at themselves. And any one of us, if we believe we're failing, if we believe we can't do it, that we're no good, will lead that kind of a life. And every single person in this room has at one time or other in their life experienced pretty serious failure. Most of you have blotted it out for the most part, all the things that you did. But if someone could take a moving picture a sound motion picture of your life during that period when you were experiencing failure, you'd be pretty horrified at some of the crazy things you did during that portion of your life. It's a very insane time when you feel failure. You do irrational things. You do things which hurt you. And this is what children do also. Now, what I was suggesting to the people at the school was to stop labeling the children failure. Just don't do it. 
But again, as I say, the concept is difficult because they said, you got to fail them. you got to. And I said, why? They said, because they're not doing any work and they're nasty. That's, that's the combination they claim that you have to fail them. If they were not doing any work and they were nice, you can sometimes pass them along. Or, or, or if they're real nasty but they do do some work, you can pass them along. But the combination of nasty and no work, that combination got to be failed. Otherwise, the intimation is the whole system would crumble. And I, and I said, no, it wouldn't. Well, again, we get back to, to the concept of what it is. And the concept is just that simple. It's don't fail them. That's all. Don't label them a failure. Don't call them a failure. Don't rate them a failure. Just say to children, you haven't learned to do it yet. Let's learn. If they don't learn, there's nothing you can do. People ask me this question. Well-meaning people with moderate intelligence ask me this question. They say, kind of triumphantly too, as if I've got a flaw in my reasoning. They say, well, what happens in a school without failure if a kid doesn't learn anything? And I, and I say, well, exactly the same thing that happens in a school with failure. In a school where kids don't learn anything, they don't learn anything. That's all there is to it. If you don't learn anything, it's the same in any school whatsoever. The idea again is that what we're trying to do is get children to learn something. If we label them a thousand kids with a failure, then most of them won't learn anything. We know that as a certainty. If we put them in a school without failure, if you eliminate failure from your school and don't label them a failure, a substantial percentage of that thousand has a chance to learn something. But I have no answer, nor does anybody else in the whole world, for what do you do with a kid who doesn't learn anything no matter what you do. The whole point in what I'm trying to say is, if we can set the situation up so more kids learn, that's the best we can do. But if you ask me any question, what happens to a kid who absolutely will never sit still or won't learn anything or throws bricks through windows every day, I don't have any better answer than you do. All I know is that if we run a school more effectively, and one of the real effective ways to run it is without failure, less children will have this kind of problem. That's all you can say. So I have no answer for the child who learns nothing no matter what you do. You'll have to get someone in a lot smarter than me. All I can say is having worked with the delinquent girls who had learned nothing for much of their life, and giving them a chance, as they said, to operate in a school where they weren't labeled a failure, a substantial percentage of them began to learn something. That's all it is. So I just don't want that misunderstood, that anything else is happening except this minimal step. But in education, this minimal step is a big step. And if you go into your school and you really try to stamp failure out of it, if it's been in the school for a long period of time, even in an elementary school, Goodness knows it's terribly hard in a secondary school, but even in an elementary school, it will be hard to do. You're, we're used to that. So you say to yourself, if this is so bad, then why do we have it? Well, there's a reason why we had it. The reason we had it was that failure had a very, very definite purpose in the history of education. The purpose was that when you failed the kids, they left school. It was the easiest and most probably the least painful method of getting them out of school. Just fail them and they'll leave. Because if you study education and its history, traditionally education, even in enlightened countries like the United States, the only thing the country ever promised was that children should have an opportunity for education. Not even maybe an equal opportunity, but an opportunity. And every kid should be exposed to some chance to get some kind of an education. But the country never envisioned and educators never believed that their responsibility was to give kids more than this opportunity. Your conference is really about giving them much more than this opportunity. But the historical, the historical condition of education wasn't that. Give them an opportunity, and if they don't take it, it's up to them, it's their responsibility, and sure it is, it still is that. But if they don't take that responsibility, fail them, and they will leave. And they did, and they still do and you got rid of them, and they went someplace else. But historically, education was only one of the many ways that young people could go to kind of make it in the world. There were lots of things you could do that were acceptable and worthwhile that didn't require much of an education. 
were farm programs, factory programs, apprenticeship programs, going into business for yourself, little programs and things like that. These were all historically possible. The other thing was historically is the country didn't care that much about whether people made it or not. That was up to them. It was a dog-eat-dog -dog kind, of, kind of society. And if you failed in school, well, that was too bad for you. And if you couldn't find anything else, that was also too bad for you. The point is, failure got kids out of school. And we did the situation to the point where you just had the motivated children left each, each year. You got rid of the failures after a very, a very low point. So you could assume when you taught school that you were dealing with kids who were motivated, and if they weren't, fail them, and they'd leave. But suddenly, after World War II, this be well, it wasn't sudden. It certainly began before World War II, but it became solidified after World War II. All of a sudden, every parent in the country who saw the values of education probably introduced by the GI Bill and other things like that, I don't know of a parent in the country, white, black, brown, uh, the racial mixes, the economic problems, and everything else, I've never yet met a parent that says, I think my child would lead a better life if he didn't have an education. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, every parent wants his kid to go through school. This not only wasn't the way that it always was traditionally, many parents were perfectly happy when their kid left. My grandfather couldn't wait for my dad to leave school. When he was 13, my grandpa said, you're through, finished, that's it, you got to go to work. That's enough horsing around going to school. There, there's little kids in the family and things to do, and my father quit school and went to work. There was no, no indication in his mind that he should do anything else. But there was some opportunity for him then in 19, uh, I guess it was about 1910 or something like that, that there just isn't today. And then that, that was the difference. So uh, uh, we still have the old system, but it doesn't apply today. Today, every parent expects that his child will not only get an opportunity to go to school, but he wants his child to go through school. God knows how far through school, but certainly through, uh, through high school. And so the, the responsibility is now on the schools. But the schools are attempting to, to take this responsibility using a system that is absolutely incompatible with it, which is still failing kids. You can't get them through if you fail them. And yet, there's a tremendous dissatisfaction in the country with the schools, a huge dissatisfaction. This dissatisfaction is based on the fact that everybody wants their kid to get an education. And everybody says that my kid's not getting a good education in school because of this reason or that reason, or he's not getting through. And even those whose kids are getting through say, if the schools would get rid of all these kids that are hampering my kid, he'd get a better education. But nobody wants their kid gotten rid of. And so you really, the, the, the job you have to do now is get everybody through, and that's a heck of a hard job. Well, all I can say is that it will not be accomplished utilizing the older traditional approach of failing kids when they don't do well. Because today, as I'll explain later, kids look at themselves much more than, than we used to even. And they say, who, who is this person that I am? And if this person comes out as a failure, they give up. They give up in a world where to give up today is a disaster because there's no guarantee if you have a good education, you're going to do that well in the world. Obviously, there's no guarantee, but there's a pretty good guarantee that if you leave school when you're 14 or 15 or 16 and you feel failure, that your chances of doing something worthwhile with your life, I just don't, I can't even conceive of what a kid does that doesn't have an education. Every one of the Lincoln girls I worked with, many of them absolute miserable school failures, still said you got to have an education or you don't have a chance. We had girls stay in the reform school, elect to stay behind bars, for periods up to six months to finish their education in reform school, voluntarily elect to stay, because they knew they didn't have a chance anyplace else. And they knew if they didn't get an education, their chances in life were absolutely limited. Well, if, if, if the delinquent girls who are, have little foresight can see this kind of a thing, and obviously this time is here, it's a big, it's a big thing I'm, I'm hammering at, but you'll find Oh, it's next door, okay. We'll find that when you, uh, when you try to get failure out of your school, when you talk to your teachers and say, we're not going to fail any more kids, they'll give you the blankest look you ever saw. They'll say, what happens if a kid doesn't learn something? What am I going to do then? What am I going to tell his parent? What am I going to tell the school board? All these things, very, very hard because the concept is very difficult. 
But let's just make the assumption in some of the schools I worked with when I first started working in the schools, let's make the assumption they could do it. That you can somehow or other get rid of failure in your school. Then the next question that, that's legitimate to ask is, if we can get rid of failure, that still, will that motivate the children to learn? And the answer to that is no, it won't. Not particularly. All it will do is decrease the negative motivation, the antagonism against school and learning. It'll put the kid in a position where he can say, well, they don't label me a failure. Maybe I ought to. That's about all it'll do. But to get children to learn, you've got to motivate them a little more, a little more positively than just not failing them. Although to me, that's, that's the first step. A teacher said, well, how do we motivate these kids? All right, we don't fail them, but they still can't read or write. and They're still upsetting the class and doing all these other things. How are we going to motivate them to learn? Just if we don't fail them, that won't mean anything. I said, well... I think that you have to make another and somewhat difficult step for teachers to make as a general as a general rule. And the step is you have to make friends with the kids. You have to give up some of the things that you were taught when you went to school and learned to be a teacher. This business about professional distance and this business about teachers here, classes there, and don't get too close and always maintain whatever it is that you're supposed to maintain. I never quite understood what this is you're supposed to maintain. I suppose it's some kind of a gap between you and the kids. But whatever it is, it's no good. And people that teach that are teaching you something that no longer applies to the children that you're trying to teach today. We must somehow or other make an effort to make friends with the kids. And people said to me, well, well specifically, what do you have in mind? And I have specific things in mind, three things. Two of them are pretty easy to do. One of them's hard to do, really hard to do. <coughs> the first thing, the first thing that that I think that we've got to learn to do, and, and, and it's easy to say, but when you go through schools, you don't see it happening all the time, that's for sure. The first thing is we have to learn that if we want to be friendly with another human being, whether he's a small child or a college student or an adult friend of ours or anybody else, you have to treat him with kindness and courtesy and consideration. Not some of the time, or not occasionally, but all the time. Now, this is the first aspect of friendship. If you have a friend who treats you with discourtesy or isn't kind to you, very obviously you're desperate for a friend. There can be absolutely no other explanation for this if you'll accept a friend that'll treat you badly. And kids aren't that desperate any more than we are. And if you treat a child with discourtesy, the child will not feel any warmth toward you. Now, people say to me, well, sure, that's easy to do, providing the child is nice to us, but how about the kid that's not nice to us? How can we treat that kid with kindness and courtesy? After all, shouldn't the child make the first step? Isn't that the ethic on which we were raised, that children are seen and not heard, that the kid makes the first move? I have never understood that ethic. It seems to me that we as adults have to make the first move. We have to, we have to be the model. We have to say, regardless, kid, how you treat us, we're going to treat you well. It's a powerful model. Works very well. I, I remember that when I first went to the Ventura School, again, these delinquent girls, some of them could be pretty tough and, and pretty rough to get along with. And I had never worked with girls like this before. I had never seen girls full of tattoos and all this kind of thing. It was all news to me. But, but I came there, and I was kind of looking, and we had a lot of little old house mothers at the school. And our house mothers, for the most part, some of these women that ran the cottages were pretty old. I don't know how old they were. Nobody really did. We suspected they had lied about their age years ago so they wouldn't have to retire. But they were, they were well on in years, well past 70. We knew that. And uh, these little old women were trying to handle rough, tough 15, 16, 17-year-old girls that would come there with kind of blood in their eye at times. And uh, I remember being in the cottage one day. And a new girl came on the cottage, and she just went after the house mother, not physically, actually, but with, with verbal abuse. I mean, she, she cursed this poor little old lady out and something awful, you know. And, and, and the poor little house mother was listening to this tirade of abuse. You know, if this would happen in a public school, why, well, you'd have a school board election if this happened, you know. But, but uh, this little old lady was listening, and she finally, she hobbled over the girl. Some of her house mothers weren't too active, and she hobbled over the girl and put her arm around her, you know, and she said, Honey, she said, you're doing well. You're doing well. <laughs> she said, not, not as well as some of the previous girls I've had, but... but uh, 
But she said, nevertheless, you're not doing badly. And she said, we want you to be happy here, and if, and, if, and if cursing a poor little old defenseless lady like me makes you happy, well, we'd like you to be happy here. You just go ahead. Well, by this time, the other girls are just cracking up in the kites. They're laughing their head off, you know. And the poor girl, she can't help but start laughing too, you know, and pretty soon, pretty soon things are quieted down. I mean, this house mother could handle the situation. She treated the girl with kindness and courtesy and said if it's absolutely necessary for this girl to curse her, well, she'd say, may as well curse me as anybody else. I guess I'm getting paid for it. So, uh, so she, and, and this is a hard thing to do. I mean, many people, have, school people especially say, well, I won't stand for that kid talking to me like that. You know, it's a very common statement that you hear around about. And I think we ought to stand for it. And I don't think it lowers us in any way. I think it kind of makes us stronger when we do that. If we, don't, if we do it with dignity and say, well, if that's how you talk, okay. We'll have to talk that way, I guess. At least you will. And uh, this kind of thing of, of always being kind and courteous has a tremendous amount of strength. When people talk to me about discipline, it's a very important part, part of discipline is to be this way. It gives you a kind of strength you can't get any other way. It totally disarms the child who's discourteous to, be re, to have courtesy returned. This, again, is hard to get going in a school because we haven't been taught this way. But it can be done. Among the things you have to do, that's not one of the real hard things. The second thing is easy. What friends do is they laugh together. And if you've got a friend, as I say, and you never laugh with them, well, it's a peculiar friendship, but you can have it. There's nothing wrong with it, but it's better to laugh once in a while. And uh, I suggest we have a few laughs in school. I really suggest that we make an effort to introduce humor into the classroom. And uh, uh, I realize, again, that goes against the old Puritan ethic that anything that's, uh, that's good can't be fun and uh, uh, vice versa, but, but I think that we can have a little fun in school. And I, and I was pointing out to some of the teachers, I bet there's classrooms where there hasn't been a laugh in 30 years. And that it's overdue. And I said, the kids want to laugh. Believe me, they want to laugh. And uh, if you get a few laughs, you go, I say, you know, I don't want to be laughing or anything, but one or two laughs a week, not going to be excessive. <laughs> and... Uh, So those two aspects are easy, but important. They have to do again with this question of motivating children. You motivate them through friendliness, courtesy, kindness, laughter, and of course not failing them. The third thing that should be going in school that has to do with friendship is harder. Friends talk with each other. Again, you know, if you have a friend and he treats you badly, doesn't laugh with you, and never talks to you, well, then you're really desperate for a friend. There's no doubt about that. But in school, we have to get some conversation going. And I said to the teachers, we've got to talk with the children. And this is hard. Easy to be courtesy, courteous. Easy to be have a few laughs. But to talk with the kids, that's a hard one. And of all the things that we're trying to do in our program, in our kind of Schools Without Failure program, to get teachers and children talking with each other, that's by far the hardest to do. The teacher said to me, well, what do you mean? Take time out each day to talk with each child? And I said, yes, absolutely. They said, well, how can we teach? If we have 30 kids in our class and we're going to talk to each kid, we'll spend all day just talking with them. We'll get any of our teaching done. And I said, well, that's a, that's a problem, and I recognize that. I said, talk with them all at once. I said, have a class discussion. Just sit down once a day and talk with them. Fifteen minutes maybe, ten minutes with little kids, five minutes with kindergartners, maybe twenty or twenty-five minutes with older children. Have a discussion once a day. They said, what do we talk about? I said, it doesn't make any difference. It doesn't really make an awful lot of difference as long as the people are involved in talking and feel it's worthwhile discussing. The teacher said, well, it's a good idea, many teachers said to me, but, but the problem is the children won't talk. And I said, how come? I said, they said they don't know, really. They just won't. I don't, I don't know how many of you uh, read this article in this morning's paper. I was chuckling when I read it. There's an article by some singer from Harvard called Tom Lehrer. He sings funny kinds of songs, I guess, and things like that. But he's also a professor of mathematics at Harvard. And he said he taught one year at Wellesley. It was just mentioned in the article. He said the girls were just beautiful to look at, he said. They taught a whole year and didn't get one question asked. 
He said it just drove him crazy. He said they had to have to leave there. And then he's really expressing something that the kids won't talk. They won't ask questions. They just kind of don't say anything. And I couldn't imagine that this was possible because whatever else the girls at the school for delinquent girls did, they could talk. That's the one thing they could do. And so I hadn't had this experience. And I said, well, it's ridiculous. I'll, make them, I'll get them to talk. Let me go in your classroom. I'll show you. I made one of the, one of the cardinal errors of a consultant. I said, I'll show you. That's, uh, <laughs> something you've got to be very, very careful. The more expert you get, I advise you, show people less and less as, you, as your reputation gets bigger and bigger. Otherwise, you ain't going to have any very long. So I said, hell, I'll go in the classroom. Who's got a class? Well, I had a lot of volunteers. And so I went in the classrooms, and within, within reasonable boundaries, the teachers were right. I couldn't get any kind of discussion going. And I tried. I worked at it. And they said, you see, the kids won't talk. And I, I, remember, I remember trying desperately to get a group of eighth graders to talk. I was doing this as a demonstration. I had about 25 teachers watching me, and I couldn't get a damn word out of these kids. <laughs> and so... Uh, so finally, I said uh, to, the, to the teachers, well, let's go in the other room and we'll talk about what you just saw. And uh, they didn't see a heck of a lot. And uh, I finally, uh, 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 you know, uh, we had to have someone watch the class. In schools, you got to have someone watch the class while you, while you take the teachers away. And the vice principal had volunteered. We held this demonstration in the library of this school. There was a big room with uh, chairs. The vice principal volunteered to come and watch the class and so we waited for a moment he was doing his duties very things but he finally came in a few moments and he walked in the room I remember the room was silent I mean this room is not noisy now but this room was almost totally silent we were just waiting for him the kids were silent and uh, he walked into the room opened the door and I'd never seen this before in school it startled me evidently schools have these but I evidently didn't go to a school system which used this operation he had a whistle and he blew it a police whistle he, he blew it real loud and jarred me, you know. I almost jumped out of my skin right there in the library. It seems sacrilegious to blow a police whistle in the library. <laughs> but he blew it anyway. And he took the whistle out of his mouth and he said in quite a firm tone, okay, everybody shut up. <laughs> Man, these... These were eighth grade kids, you know, and, 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 they, and they said to me, they, they had recognized my discomfort in my attempts to get them to talk. And they said, you see why we don't talk? And I said, I'm beginning to get the picture. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so anyway, I couldn't get the kids to talk and I couldn't figure out why, you know, what was going on here. I tried and tried. And finally, uh, I came to the conclusion that among other things, exclusive of whistles and things like that, that what I was dealing with was a mechanical problem. I mean, these are small things. I mean, I hate to body with small things, but, but they're important, evidently. I said to the teachers, if we want to get the kids to talk, we're going to have to rearrange the chairs of the room so the chairs are in a circle. Now, that doesn't seem like a hell of a lot to ask, you know, to get the chairs in a circle so that you could have a conversation assuming that the conversation would have a valuable payoff in motivation, which I can assure you it does have, absolutely does have. But the teachers told me you can't move the chairs. I didn't know that you couldn't move the chairs. I thought you could. And I immediately panicked, and I said, is there a state law against it? Because California, like most states, has a whole lot of laws. You've got to be careful of these laws. You can break them any time, so you've got to be very, very careful. And, uh, and I thought immediately there was a state law against moving the chairs in the school. But they said, no, as far as they knew, there was no law against it or rule or anything like that. What they said was that uh, uh, the custodian didn't want the chairs moved. That's what they told me. <laughs> I, I hadn't realized what the power structure was. I was new in the organization. <laughs> so I said... I said, well, does he have the chairs spotted, you know? Can we move them and move them back? Would he carry them? No, no, they said, if you move them back, it's okay. Just, just as long as you get them back approximately where they were. So I said, all right, fine. But then I heard another thing, which, which again, I had never heard much before in, except in school. I, maybe I'm naive, but I didn't even hear this much in the delinquent girls' school, really. The teacher said, we're frightened to move the chairs. And I said, why are you frightened? 
said, well, we're scared we're going to lose control. And I, and I was working down in the Watts schools, by, and I heard this for the first time. And I said to them, lose what? And they said, lose control. And so it occurred to me that what I had been seeing in that school was called control. It had never occurred to me that this was control. I had come from a jail where we did have a modicum of control. I hadn't seen anything that I could reasonably call control in this school. So I said, look, I said, if this is what you call control, believe me, we're not going to lose it because we move a few chairs. And so we moved the chairs without, without losing what they called control there. And, and, and it was okay. Wrote it drew a circle on the blackboard, and I said to the kids, what's this? They said a circle, so we at least had a m moderate geometry lesson to start with. I said, let's move the chairs like this, and I said, oh, you kids move them into that part, and we drew the circle off into quadrants and moved the chairs in a circle. Well, in a circle, I could get them to talk. It wasn't easy, but it was possible, and so I suggested the teachers do this, and I demonstrated then meeting after meeting, discussion after discussion, over the four or five years that I worked there, I must have done close to a thousand of these as a demonstration. I learned how to do it. And, and, and it can be done. And I, and I don't claim it's easy. I used to think a teacher could do this if she did 30 or 40. I now say if a teacher works hard to learn this discussion technique of talking to the children about something of interest to them, or even of class problems at times, or trying to discuss things that have to do with the curriculum to see if they have any real understanding of what they're learning, Questions like, what is social studies? I only had one girl in Bedford, Ohio so far. Out of the probably 50 times I've asked that question in demonstrations of children all over the country, many of whom have had social studies for six or seven years. What is social studies? So far, one girl in Bedford, Ohio, a fourth grader, has answered it. Nobody else knew. Well, it's interesting to ask a question like that because then you begin to find out that they don't know what it is they've been taking for five years. And I think that it's not unwarranted to tell them what social studies is. I think this would be a, a, a nice thing for many kids to know, that this subject isn't, doesn't have to be a mystery. People wonder why they're not turned on by it. They don't even know what it is. So, And if you don't believe that, go back to your own school, go into the fourth grade, sixth grade, second grade class, and say, what is social studies? If you've got a kid that can define it, then you're, you've got a kid as smart as that girl in Bedford, Ohio who was so far number one in the country, because she's the only one that knew. <laughs> I had one girl, one girl up in Canada said social studies is the American way of educating people by what they're supposed to do. So uh, that wasn't bad. <laughs> so you talk with them, and the teacher said to me, well, OK, suppose we do this. Suppose Well, it'll do a lot of good. It'll motivate them to learn, stop all the behavior problems. Oh, it'll do all those things. I didn't know whether it would or it wouldn't, but you know, I was a consultant down here, and things were not too, going too well, and I was reaching a level of desperation to try and get people to do some of these things because they're hard to do. And when you talk about class discussions, people say, how often should we do it? And I'd say every day. For how long? I'd say forever. That's a long time. Every day forever is a reasonably long period of time, especially when I was dealing with people that I thought were hoping that I would say once in the fall and once in the spring. <laughs> there was a big disparity between their expectations and what I was asking. And I said, the payoff will be every day forever. And it's interesting. I got some teachers to do this, and, I, and, and things got better. They really did. In schools where things weren't too good, things got better. And the teacher said to me, Gee, that's good. And then they continued, and then some teachers said, well, the problems are returning, the discipline problems especially, because this is a remarkable a remarkable program to reduce so-called little discipline problems. And I said, gee, that's too bad. I thought this would work if you, you know. I said, are you still doing the class discussions? And they said, no, 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 we're not doing them anymore. We stopped when things got better. And, 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 and this... If you, if you try to get this program started in your school, this will happen to you almost as a one-to-one -one ratio. They will do them. They'll say they're good. They'll say things got better, and then they'll stop. And you'll say, well, we're, you know, how would things go? Oh, it was a really good technique, but, but I don't know. It's just, I don't know. We don't have time or 
and, and it doesn't really work because because you know if the kids are bad again but uh, well why don't you do it again well I don't know maybe we'll try something else it's very difficult to get people to correlate the fact that these things will make things better in school very very difficult mostly because if any of you have tried to do this it's hard to do it takes a year to learn to do it if everybody in the school does it then things get a lot better well, I got one school to get almost everyone to do it. I got the principal to go into classes and do these meetings. Very important that the principal demonstrate this technique to his staff if he believes in it. I got the counselor doing it with me. I was doing it seven, eight, ten meetings a week. And I got the uh, and I got this thing going. And things did get better. Discipline problems dropped. In the Central City School where there had been kids lined up to see the principal for disciplinary infractions, the kids weren't lined up anymore. Sometimes hours would go by and no kid would come to the office, which was a rare thing. Parent attendance at PTA meetings, which was 12 and 15 in a school of 1,200, went up to 3 and 400. The auditorium became packed with parents. The kids reported they were happy in school, so the parents then had the nerve to come to school. Parents won't come where the kids are unhappy unless they're summoned, and of course they won't come voluntarily otherwise. Motivation went up, vandalism started going down. I wouldn't say that there was a 100% turnover, it wasn't that, but things got better. It became obvious to everybody things were better. These techniques, if they're used, will work. The question is whether you'll use them or not. That's the hard point. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to teach people. we got our seminars to try and Are really looking for something that will work that they don't have to do that's the thing everybody's searching for I wish I could come up with that miraculous thing something will work you don't have to do but these things you got to do otherwise they won't work and, and past talking about it it's hard to get people to do them even though people complain bitterly the kids are hard to deal with and they're not learning and they're not motivated and they're discipline problems so so I don't know. So I worked on this a long period of time. I said, you got to figure out some way to convince people it's worth doing. And I couldn't come up with anything. I got a lot of questions from teachers who said, why does it work? And I said to myself, I did, really didn't know why it worked. I'm suggesting things to do that seem to work. And I can show you now plenty of schools in which they do work. This is not an abstract claim, providing people do them. But why they work? Well, I didn't know. I'd already written the book Schools Without Failure. I'm into 1969 now. I'm telling people do these things. I'm saying they're good, but if you honestly ask me why they work or you read that book carefully, the book doesn't say why they work because I didn't know. Yet there must be a reason. Because these techniques were not necessary in previous years. Children were motivated by fear to do well in school or they were motivated by failure to get out. This is the way school traditionally was. Fear kept them in that wanted to work, and failure got rid of those that didn't want to work. Nobody had to have class meetings. You didn't have to have too many laughs. We had a few laughs in class, but my schooling wasn't overburdened with laughter, I can tell you that. And as far as teachers treating me courteously, I almost always was treated courteously by teachers as I went through school. And I can tell you that I always treated them courteously. I did it first. That's how I was raised. That was a tradition. We were afraid not to. And my vice principal in our high school was a benevolent man. Goodness knows he was benevolent. But when he said, rise off the floor, you rose off the floor. And you didn't come down until he said, come down. And if you're vice principaling in any high school around and about, and you're asking the kids to rise off the floor, you got troubles today. They're not rising anymore. Basically, the children are no longer frightened, or those that are frightened <coughs> are harder and harder to frighten. People used to ask me, principals especially, they'd say, did you learn anything working in prisons that we could use to frighten the kids in school? <laughs> because as many principals really are running out on things to scare kids with. And, and uh, uh, if you have run out of things to scare kids with and you're in a state of desperation, then I, I really seriously uh, uh, ask you to consider some of the things I've said. Try something else because the fear won't work that well. 
So people said when they tried these things, they said, you know, it does work. Not great. God knows it's not great, but it does begin to work. There's less discipline problems. Some of the children are more motivated. They're friendlier. I'm getting to know them better. Somehow or other, there's something better going on in class. Why, why is this happening? And why didn't we need this? I said, well, I th I'm sure I said if I would have had it in school, I'd have done better. But I didn't need it. But I think kids today need it, but I don't know why. There must be a reason. I'm postulating that children have changed. And I didn't know the reason. And I started reading every place I could read and talking to people. What's happened? All these people are advertising. You read some books like The Greening of America. They're all saying some things have happened. And probably they're right. But the man who I think put his finger on what's happened, the man that caused me from the moment I read his little sentence to start writing this new book, The Identity Society, because I think we're in a new society now where things are different. And education has to be different for this society. Marshall McLuhan, he said in an answer to an interview in Playboy magazine, unlikely place to find erudite statement, but there it was, I think one of the most important statements of the 20th century. They asked McLuhan, why all the turmoil among the young people? And McLuhan said, the young are searching not for a goal, but for a role. And if you will understand what McLuhan was saying, you can begin to understand yourself, your own children, and the children you're dealing with in school. Because young people today have a different motivation than what motivated me when I was young. I was goal motivated. I said I had better do what has to be done. And then if I get it done, maybe I'll be lucky and find something in the end that will allow me to fulfill myself. Goal for me became before role. Doing the job came before self-fulfillment. What I operated under, and what most of you who are older operated under, was a traditional order of events that had taken place for 10,000 years of civilization at least. That most people were motivated first by the job that had to be done, security, to stay alive. These were the tasks that motivated people. Then if you got, gained security, then you could relax and enjoy yourself and try to look for whatever it is that every human being looks for, enjoyment, satisfaction as a human being. But that came second, and security or survival came first, the natural order of events for 10,000 years. All of the institutions which were built in this natural order were institutions which paid off for people following the correct sequence, goal before role. If a kid comes to school and he does the right thing, the school has always rewarded him, both academically and personally, if he did the right thing. But not until he did it first. The right thing came first. Do what you're supposed to do, kid, and then you get your reward. Whole, you know, generations of people live their lives in misery hoping that they would gain their reward in heaven, which wasn't a bad hope. If you had no reward on earth, at least hope for it in heaven. That's a hard thing to sell today. If any of you do any part-time preaching, you'll find your flock, you'll find your flock is not too interested in waiting for heaven to get their reward. People kind of want it now on earth. Something has happened to our society, and McLuhan put his finger on it. We have shifted very suddenly from a goal-oriented society to a role-oriented society. By that I mean the thing that moves most young people, and many of us, and everyone you're dealing with in school, the thing that motivates them is role prior to goal. What the young people are saying is, you must accept me, respect me, and give me a chance to enjoy myself somewhat in your operation before I'll consider the goals that you've laid out. Now, I don't want people to misunderstand and say that goals have disappeared. They haven't. The only thing that's changed is the sequential order of motivation. We are now living in an identity society, a society where for almost everyone, especially the young, what moves us first is the desire to fulfill ourselves as people, to be recognized, to enjoy ourselves. And if we believe that this is not possible, then we'll have little motivation to do anything else but some or other seek to fulfill ourselves in one way or another. And the children that you're working with in school are motivated in this direction. 
And the things that I suggested are in the proper sequence to get them to do the work they have to do. Don't fail people who are role-oriented. If you fail a goal-oriented person, what you're saying is, if school's your goal, this isn't it. Go find another one. And there were other goals in the society which were acceptable and you could look for. If you fail a role-oriented person, you're not saying to him that you've just failed school. What you've said is you failed as a human being. You're not worth very much. I talked to the kids in Watts and asked them this question over and over again. What does it mean when you get a bad grade or a low score? And the children repeated over and over again, it means you're a bad person. And I would argue and say, no, no, I'm just saying you just got a bad grade on an arithmetic test. Well, that doesn't mean you're a bad person. They said, it means you're bad, Dr. Glasser. See, role-oriented people take inability to do something as a personal thing. And they begin to look at themselves as failures. And they say, the person I am, the role I've taken on is the role of a failure. But since my first motivation is to fulfill myself, what I'll have to do is fulfill myself as a failure. And the goals that a failure person will work toward that will reinforce himself as a failure are very simple. Just disrupt or don't work or be antagonistic or do any of the things that you struggle with. Those are the goals of a failing person. And those goals will further reinforce their role of a failure. And this is why it's so, so important not to allow children to identify themselves as failures. If they do this, then they will easily fulfill this identification in the things they do. Because as I said now, role precedes goal. And children are looking for goals that will further reinforce their conception of themselves. They are, and you are, and everybody is. And if we think of ourselves as a successful person, then we'll look for goals which will further reinforce our feeling about ourselves. And the curriculum in school certainly can be a reasonable goal, providing the child says, I'm And there's a minimal amount of enjoyment here, so I better pay attention to some goals which will further reinforce me. Children have not given up hard work or goals, but what they're saying is, first, first give me some minimal reinforcement and acceptance as a human being. If you don't do that, I won't work toward these goals. And that's what you're seeing. We give them acceptance in a sense and reinforcement as a human being in many cases, but we do it as a failure. We say we accept you as a failure, as an adequate person, as a, as a dud. But then they work for those goals that reinforce that failure. That's the, that's the difference. We're now in a new society, a society which came about probably because three things happened. One thing happened, they all stemmed from World War II and the tremendous affluence generated by this war. After World War II, our politicians made a decision that although things probably aren't to be that great, at least we're not going to go back to the economic level that we'd been at previously. And so after World War II, while everyone is far from affluent, more people in the Western world have more than people ever had before. You've got more, and you're pretty well assured you'll have a little more. And you're able, for the first time, a whole generation of people, to give to their kids something more than they had when they grew up. All parents have wanted to do that, but we as parents have been able to do it. And as we've given these children more, they've become convinced that they themselves are important. We've given them these things, and we've also told them that you're important, kid. And that's helped the kid begin to feel this. We've also become more concerned with human rights legally. We've also probably, this, this may be the most important, although I think all three blend together in this unique combination, which has produced this new society society which is very puzzling to us, a society which is hard to understand, a society where kids go around and say, pay attention to me, I'm important, where kids go against the established codes, where they start acting out in all kinds of ways which make it very difficult for us to understand, trying to fulfill themselves, a role-oriented society, 
where role, in a sense, really comes now before go, like McLuhan said. The television hammering home a message continually. Television says, be yourself, be somebody, enjoy yourself. Life's for the living and the enjoying. Nothing's hard. All problems can be solved in 28 minutes. They showed two programs which showed the real world on television in the last 25 years, and the country was up in arms about two programs, each for an hour. One program was called Hunger in America, and the other program was called The Selling of the Pentagon. And the whole country got upset that this happy medium should have the audacity to show the real world. And of course, television only did it twice for two hours and 25 years, and, uh, and won't do it again, I don't think, anymore. They'll never make that mistake again. So our kids are exposed to this fantasy media. And they're exposed to it a lot. And the media says, it's not important to work hard, and it's not important to save and scrimp and do the things that our generation was told. It's important to enjoy yourself and be somebody. And don't worry. That's the main thing TV says, is don't worry. Even when they show you on the news some of the horrible things are going on in the world, what they're really saying is, isn't it great that you're at home watching this on television? It's not happening to you. This is the implication. We'll show it to you, but don't worry about living it. And this, this, this media has been very pervasive. The products are sold through happiness. This is how you sell. Very few manufacturers are, are, are in any way uh, able to show their product in, in any way unhappy. That said, Ford Motor Company cares about you now. They had advertised this on the radio, on the TV. You see, call this number and talk to someone that cares. Well, I have never called that number because I don't own a Ford. But, 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 but if I did, I'd give it a try. And I'm sure they would care. Nothing much would happen in terms of your car, but they would say they would care anyway. <laughs> SO Gas is now advertised in California. I, I can't get over this advertisement. I hear it. It says, SO gets involved. I, mean, I don't understand what the hell SO is getting involved about. Are they trying to get you to drink the gasoline? I, I just want some crud that runs my car as cheaply as possible. I don't care whether they get involved with me or not. But they, they're, they're claiming that that's good for business. Pepsi-Cola was the first one that came out with the idea. They first sold Pepsi-Cola by the idea you get twice as much for your money, too. You know, 12 full ounces is a lot, twice as much for your nickel or something like that. Remember those terms if you're old enough to remember that. But then after the war, when everybody had a dime, the Pepsi-Cola people got upset that they were selling theirs for a nickel. And they said, let's raise it to a dime. And someone says, well, how can we advertise 12 full ounces for a nickel if we raise it for a dime? And the fellow says, let's not be mundane and, and, and talk about things like price. Let's tell them what Pepsi will do for them. The chairman of the board says, what in the hell can Pepsi do for them? <laughs> and so my advertisement man said, it'll make them happy. And, and, and the chairman said, it'll only make us happy. It won't make them happy. He said, you missed the point, you know. And he says, what do you mean? He says, well, just tell them, be sociable, drink Pepsi. The chairman said, are you crazy? Be sociable, drink Pepsi. You want sociability, there's a hell of a lot better drinks than Pepsi. <laughs> but, 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 but the fellow says, it doesn't matter whether it'll do it or not. He said, that's what people are hungering for. We're in a new world. The advertising man, of course, found this out in 1951. I found out in 1969 after I read it. But, but I mean, a psychiatrist is always a little behind the times anyway. But so the point is that... Uh, uh, it sold a lot of Pepsi-Cola. That really did. Be sociable, drink Pepsi. This non sequitur. And the cigarette companies advertise that these cigarettes will make you happy. Even if you have cancer, it'll be a happy form of cancer. <laughs> Winston cigarette, I think it was Winston, some sexy-looking girl or sounding girl would, would say, me and my Winston, you know, as if Winston was the ultimate, evidently, because you didn't even need another person. At least in Pepsi, in Pepsi they advertised you needed persons with Pepsi, but with Winston you could just do it with a cigarette. <laughs> fortunately, fortunately, fortunately that kind of pornography has been now ruled off the air, which, <laughs> which, which I'm very happy to see that the country is settling down. The, 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 the thing is that, that this is a powerful, a powerful media, which, which hammers home role. Now, you're teaching school. 
You can't compete with the media like this very well. You have little kids now. In all of your schools, we have this thing called hyperactivity. Everyone, everyone's worried about hyperactive kids. The, the neurologists, who I guess didn't have enough business, have gotten into the act now and uh, uh, say that these little kids all have minimal brain damage. We can't find it, but we know it's there. And uh, it's like minimal athletes, but you know. <laughs> everyone says you've always got it, but we can't see it, you know. Well, but everyone says, well, it doesn't make sense that any kid that's, that acts like this in school has brain damage. And it seems sensible because it obviously couldn't be the school, so it must be the kid's brain. And uh, uh, I, I have a lot of doubts about all this brain damage that's suddenly around. I don't think the atomic testing has done quite that much harm to the population. And so uh, uh, I have a feeling that what we're dealing with are children who've been exposed to excessive amounts of television, who, when they watch television, if you want your kid to be a track star, you wouldn't put him in a, in a body cast for the first five years of his life and say, rest your legs until they get older and then they'll run better. Well, if you want your kid to learn how to socialize and give and take, and it's, there's tough socialization in school for a little kid. There's a lot of, there's a big group, there's a teacher kind of yelling at him. There's a lot of things he's got to learn quickly about give and take. To do that, the expectation has been that during the formative years of his life, two, three, four, five years of age, he was out learning to socialize with big brothers and little brothers and big kids and the rough and tumble of the neighborhood, which was a good way to learn about life. And if he was raised properly, which means he got out a little bit and, 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 uh, and socialized with kids, he'll be a fine in kindergarten. Kindergarten will be kind of nice compared to the rough and tumble of, a, of an ordinary neighborhood. But if he spent his first years of his life sitting in front of a television set, in, 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 a, social, in a social body cast, you could say, just relating and having this, this media stimulate his brain but not in any way teach him the socialization skills necessary to have when you come to school. Then he comes to school without these skills. And the teacher says, my God, I got a pack of kids here that I can't get through to. Because what happens is suddenly exposed to people and to the need to socialize and interact and to be quiet and all these kinds of things, the child can't handle it. He doesn't know what to do. He has been asocialized by this media. Now, I'm not saying there aren't some really hyperactive kids, but nowhere is near the proportion so diagnosed. That one of the things you can do to check out what I'm saying is bring a television set into your kindergarten or first grade class and turn it on and watch what happens. They immediately get quiet. I've tried it. I checked this out. They get quiet. Because the television, again, gives them the, 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 the kind of attention that they're used to. And they no longer calls forth their socialization skills and makes no demands upon them. The teacher's got to make a few demands. So the television set has not only said to them, you're important and enjoy yourself, it's also hampered their capability of learning the socialization skills to gain a reasonable role. So if you don't learn anything else from today's talk, at least take home to your community the idea that maybe we ought to, as a school system, to protect ourselves advise parents to limit the watching of their small children, the low television watching of their small children. I don't think it does that much harm to older kids, uh, 7, 8, 9, 10, 12 year olds maybe, but to these little kids who need this basic socialization skill, who should be raised. I didn't have the world's greatest mother or anything like that, and she wouldn't advertise herself as being, but she knew something about raising kids, and many of you were raised by the same kind of mother which was she was an out-of-the-house mother. I don't know if you had that kind of a mother. But kids did weren't in the house. As soon as you're old enough, you were, you know, thrown out in the morning, you were let in for lunch for a short period, thrown out again in the afternoon. And it had to be pretty bad weather before you got back into the house. And because kids were out. That's where kids were. If you came home alive, that was good, you know, and then that was all there was to it. Well, when you're out of the house, you learn how to handle yourself and you learned it early, and you learned that big brothers beat you up, and you learn how to run, and things like that. These are all skills you don't learn when you're all sitting watching a television set in parallel. You should live your life in series, kind of interacting between people, not in parallel watching a television set. Well, this is an important thing to realize, that we're dealing with kids who are role-oriented, but don't have the basic requisites to fulfill their role. The school now has the job of teaching them socialization. And, of course, the ways I'm discussing are critically important. What's the most socializing media there is? 
a discussion where you learn to listen to people, speak your mind, and listen to others speak their mind, and track on a subject. That's the ultimate in socialization. Most of us are desperately searching for that in our lives right now. If uh, To find someone that will talk with us, listen to us, and track on a subject is an exhilarating experience. So if we give this to children in school, we can outdo the, the damage of this media. And if you don't believe what I said, then you ought to pay attention to a study done recently in Cincinnati by a man that, uh, that studied these things. He studied only one thing, really. How much do little kids watch television? And found out that preschoolers watch television on the average, and this is a big average, 64% of their waking time. That means if they're up 12 hours, they're watching television approximately 8. And they work a 7-day week, mind you, on this 5-day week. 50 hours a week in front of this media. Goodness knows how many thousand hours before they come to school. The point is, this has got to have an effect. I'm not just talking uh, as if this is a minor effect on kids. I don't care what you do. If you do it steadily for 50 hours a week, it's going to affect you, wh whatever it is. And television will have that effect. So we have now this new ball game. We have children who are role-oriented. They've been raised that way, and the television has helped them. And they have parents who have given them some security. We don't have too many little red hens anymore. That's just the way it is. Remember little red hen? She, she baked her bread and she put up her freezer and did all the things in the summer when she could have been horsing around with the grasshopper. She wasn't. No, it wasn't the little red hen. It was the ant. That's right. I forgot. Well, uh, yeah, the hen would have eaten the grasshopper. No, uh, no, it was the ant. I remember the old Disney fable. And when the winter time came and the grasshopper, who was role oriented, he was he was standing outside in the cold and. He was asking to come in. Little little ant said, nothing doing. You know, you had your chance, buddy, and it's all over. Well, the fable scared me when I was a kid. If I had any idea about becoming a grasshopper, I changed it. But the, uh, the point is that the children are not grasshoppers. It's not a complete analogy, but they need some of this role reinforcement to do the work that has to be done. They also need you, if they've had a lot of television, to help them to learn how to be socialized people. And talking with them is by far the most effective way. Now, if you can do that in a school, you can create an atmosphere where children are learning. You can create an atmosphere where there are very, very few discipline problems. Because what you've done is create an atmosphere where people feel good about themselves and feel successful. And you don't have to fail them. It will do no good anyway. And if you do it, you'll reduce the motivation very drastically because you now fail them as a human being not just in a subject or a grade in school. And as I say, people say to me, well, what do we do with the kids who don't learn? I don't have an answer to that any more than anybody else. This system that I'm advocating will cause more kids to learn, and that's the best you can do is try to raise your efficiency. Now, there's one other aspect we're talking about this morning, which has more to do with secondary schools and primary school. If the children are role-oriented, if they say, I'm important, then they begin, especially as they grow, to say to themselves, what I'm learning must relate to the person that I am. More and more children are saying this and asking these questions. I never asked this question. It never even occurred to me to ask the question, is what I'm learning at school, is it relevant to my life? I just said this was a goal I had to do. If it made sense, good. If it didn't make sense, well, okay, it didn't make sense. In other words, children today are demanding more sensible education. They're not going to fight for it. They're not even really going to be able to explain it. What they'll do is they'll kind of say, if it doesn't make much sense, we just won't put forth the effort to learn it. So goals have to be human goals in which we get human reinforcement, but they also have to be sensible goals. Therefore, in secondary school, we have especially to do another job that doesn't have to be done so much in elementary school, because in elementary school, the goals are sensible. All you're really trying to do in elementary school, even though you may teach some subjects, all you're really trying to do is get, is get the kids to learn the skills. If they can get the skills, then they're well prepared for secondary school. If they feel good about themselves, they can read and write and do some arithmetic, that's fine. But in secondary school, we're now attempting to do something. Well, we always were. We're attempting to teach them some subjects. Some of the subjects in secondary school are pretty unusual subjects. 
They were taught in the past strictly to weed kids from school. We'll give them these subjects and we'll get rid of them. The, the necessity, for instance, of putting algebra at the ninth grade in almost all school curriculums. The purpose of algebra in the ninth grade was to immediately get rid of the kids who weren't bound for college. This, this did a very good job of getting rid of them. Teach it poorly, that's even a better way to get rid of them. Teach the algebra poorly, don't explain what it's for or what it's about. Give them a lot of these, these problems that are very difficult to, uh, to, to answer and you'll fail a lot of kids in algebra. If you examine what's going on in the ninth grade of your secondary schools, you'll find, unless you have an unusual math department, that a high percentage of kids are doing badly in algebra. Now, have the kids become more stupid? No, they haven't become more stupid. They're probably, uh, I'd say, probably smarter than kids used to be. What happens is that they all have to take algebra now because all their parents want them to go to college. But they see no sense in taking algebra, even though it is a relatively sensible subject. Say, in contrast to geometry, which is totally nonsense, algebra at least is on the math track. Geometry is somewhere is off in God's country. I don't know where it is, but it has nothing to do with mathematics. It's just an old standby that Euclid liked, and so it's still in the, uh, in the curriculum. But uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the kids are not getting it in algebra because the, the subject isn't taught to them in a sensible way. And, and this is very difficult. They're not getting it in a lot of the other subjects. So I had to go through this in my mind, and I really had to analyze and say, what is it that makes a subject sensible to a child? And there are three factors that I think you could examine and go back to your school. If you have any power in your school, go back to your school and even throw a little weight around and see if you can get these factors to, uh, to kind of come forth. Kids, as I say, are role-oriented, and they want something that makes sense to me as a human being. If the goal makes sense, it will further motivate them to learn it. There are three aspects of education. Well, let me say this first of all, that what makes us feel good will motivate us. This is a very highly motivating thing. Now, what, are the what is the intellectual operation that makes us feel good? If we're real hungry, food makes us feel good. If we're real thirsty, water makes us feel good. If we're real hot, an air-conditioned room will make us feel good. Intellectually, thinking makes us feel good. Because the things that I mentioned, being in a room that's too hot or too cold, getting heating or cooling, being hungry or being thirsty, these are survival functions of your nervous system. Your brain tells you when you're hungry, get something to eat and it hurts if you don't get something to eat. Now, your brain does not warn you with pain quickly, but will also produce some pain when you're in a non-thinking atmosphere. If I suddenly would lapse into Chinese and lecture you for the next four hours in Chinese, most of you would start suffering pain. If I had some armed guards at the door, anytime someone got up to leave, I would have them shot immediately. So you'd sit pretty quietly under those circumstances. Your survival nervous system would say, we better sit and listen to this Chinese. But you would be suffering a lot of pain in the process. The pain would be because you would say, what in the world can my brain do with this? And unless you speak Chinese, you couldn't do anything with it. So you'd be suffering. What happens is when we're in a position where we, our brain is forced into a totally inactive and non-thinking position, boredom is the word we use for it mostly, when we're in this position, it hurts. And therefore, the way to relieve boredom is to get your brain active. The way we survived as a race over the last four million years, not going into a lot of anthropology, is that thinking be, is a survival function. That those people who couldn't think were not descended from them. They couldn't think their way clear to survive the obstacles, so we're descended from a thoughtful and cooperative group of people. Humans had to thoughtfully cooperate with each other. Therefore, cooperation always feels good, and thinking always feels good, because the payoff for a survival function has got to be feeling good. That's the whole payoff. If when you got hungry, it felt better and better and better, we'd all starve to death. Pain is associated with non-survival. Pleasure is associated with survival. Therefore, thinking is a survival and pleasurable function. Therefore, if we introduce thinking into the curriculum, it will feel good 
and children will be encouraged to do more of whatever the operation is which involves thinking. Therefore, one curriculum function is thinking. And if your curriculum in school has thinking in it, then it will be a relevant curriculum for this new identity society child who will not subordinate the feelings of pleasure just to get through school, but says, I want to feel good and learn something that makes sense to me. Now, I define thinking about the way John Holt defined in his book. He does a better definition. It's worth reading. And how children fail. In the back, he has a little section called summarizing. If you read this section carefully, it's a good description of thinking, as good a description of thinking as I've ever seen written down anywhere. It's clear, concise, and well-written. He defines it essentially as thinking is figuring out what to do when you don't know what to do. That's what thinking is all about. That could be creative thinking, inductive thinking. Maybe you force yourself to do it in terms of, of trying to create something. But nevertheless, the real pleasure is when you, when you figure something out when you didn't know how to solve it, how to figure it out, how to do something, create a picture, a work of art, anything. It's creating something out of nothing when you didn't really know exactly what to do using your brain. Now, this is a very powerful function. The more we use it in school, the more we'll motivate kids to, to, of course, work hard, but also we'll prepare them for the problems of this world, all of which are thoughtful problems. There are no easy answers to the problems facing our society. We will solve the problems we're facing with with thoughtful, cooperative action. If we are educated that way, then we're having a chance to educate our kids for, for real survival in this, in this society where, where things are hard in terms of, of many things. So thinking's always good. Thinking's the difference, I'd say, between bridge and bingo. <laughs> school, for many kids, and I'm saying this seriously, you have to go back to your own school and check it out, school's like a bingo game with no prizes. A non-think game, but no prizes. Now, you say, well, some kids at least get A's. That's true. Some do get A's, and that's the prize. But many kids play bingo in school with a card that's got a little green dot on it. And after four or five years, they'll timidly ask the teacher, what does this green dot on my card mean? And the teacher will say, kid, that card means you'll never go bingo. And for many children, they're in a bingo game where they will never go bingo. They'll never get a good grade. And their motivation in this operation is nil. How would you like to play in a long-term bingo game with no prizes where you never even went bingo? That would be a rough situation. And yet that's the way it is for many kids. Bridge is different. If we set up these chairs into bridge groups, many people in this room would happily play bridge the rest of the afternoon, all through the evening. You would need no prizes. You'd need no money. Some of you wouldn't even need food. If you got into a bridge game, this use of your brain, this thoughtful and hopefully cooperative use of your brain in a bridge game, it says the game has elements of cooperation. It. Some of you haven't noticed it, but it does have elements of it in it. <laughs> This has a tremendous payoff, and that's why people play bridge and don't need much of anything except this thoughtful cooperation use of their brain. So this is the difference. Schools have to incorporate thinking into their, into their operation. Now, how we do that? Well, we don't have time to go into that, but certainly I'm sure that this could be gone into. Now, the second thing schools do, thinking is the most important thing. Schools do it. In terms of, say, the test, let's say that's the payoff, the tests and the real discussions in class, probably kids spend 1 or 2% of their time involved in thinking as they go through school. This is higher in the elementary school and diminishes as you get in the secondary school, disappears by graduate school totally. You'll never get through graduate school if you do any thinking. You'll just never get your degree, that's all. But uh, uh, by the time you get to graduate school, you become relatively goal-oriented, so it doesn't bother you to any great extent. You want the degree more than yourself. And so you subordinate your own, your own personality to get this degree. We all do that. There's nothing, nothing really wrong with that because the operation is set up that way. Uh, uh, it, if it were set up by thoughtful people, it would be different, but it's not. And uh, uh, I mean, it, it's, like, it's like, you know, uh, television is not the only place that employs the retarded, that's for sure. <laughs> it's just one of the prime places, that's all. You run into them in other places. Well, there's another aspect of education. People often say when I talk about thinking, I get someone in the back that says, yeah, but how about the facts, man? you got to know the facts before you can think. 
actually, I want to get into a long philosophical discussion, most of the great thinking that was done in the world was done in absence of the facts. That's just a truth. The thinking was developed before the facts became known. They knew how to immunize against smallpox long before they knew the facts of the operation. Someone just did a little thinking and found that girls who milk cows never caught smallpox. And uh, rather than expose everybody, make everybody milk cows, they finally figured out that they got a disease called vaccinia, which was uh, cowpox. And uh, 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 when they had that, they were immune to smallpox. This was, this was a thoughtful operation, but long before everybody knew the facts of the operation. Well, you can give thousands of, uh, of things to state to bear that out. But nevertheless, there are facts that need to be known. And so besides thinking, I think it's worthwhile in school to do what I call learning. Now, learning in many cases is, is involved with thinking. And so, but I'm defining learning over and above thinking as something else. So you can see the three operations in school. Learning is committing to memory. The way I define it, committing to memory, facts, knowledge, information, which have no value, excuse me, which have value in life. I mean, excuse me, general value in life. I, I made a mistake here. Facts, knowledge, and information, which are generally useful in life. For example, spelling. Spelling is not a thoughtful operation, yet if you don't know how to spell, people will generally consider you to be uneducated, and it will, it'll harm you not to know how to spell. It's good to know a little arithmetic. It's good to know who the first president was and that uh, uh, hot air rises and cold air falls and that if you drop the glass, gravity takes effect and it'll hit the floor and things like that. There's a lot of facts worth learning. School is an efficient place to teach many of these facts. There's no reason not to teach them in school, providing they'll pass the test of being generally useful in life. If you ask a kid to memorize a list of things, but you know that that list of things will be useful in life. Like when I was going to college, I learned the multiplication tables up to 24. It was very useful to know them up to 24, so I did it. I, I used them, and, and it made sense to me. Now, what's, what's the other aspect? Thinking and learning are good. Together, they can be a good curriculum. Which has value only in school has no value outside of school. And to the extent that we do this, and most schools do this about 85% of the time in the secondary school, more so in college and graduate school, that if we do, to the extent that we do this, we turn off kids in terms of their new need, which is role need for education to be related to life. For example, I'll give you this example, you've heard it before, but it's the best one I've ever run across. My kid came home in the 11th grade and he said, Dad, I've got a problem with my history final. I said, what's the problem, kid? Because I'm a good father and I always want to hear about the problems. And he said, uh, 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 she's, given us a, she's giving us a final test and she's given us some of the questions. I said, well, so what? That's kind of a good break. He said, well, it's not such a good break. You know what one of the questions is? And I said, well, tell me. And he said, she wants us to memorize the President of the United States in the order of their election. I said, well, so, I mean, and I started to laugh. It really struck me funny. I really started to laugh when that registered on me. The, the impact of that question hit me. He said, what are you laughing about? It's not funny to me. And I said, well, I'm laughing because it makes me feel good. He said, what do you mean makes you feel good? I said, well, it just does. I can't explain it. He said, well, explain it. I said, well, I said, whenever I hear anything like that, it makes me feel good inside because I'll never have to do it again. It's all, it's, it's all over for me. I said, I've paid my prices and I'm through. He says, well, what should I do? I said, well, you learn the presidents. What do you mean, what should you do? <laughs> and yeah, he, he said, well, well, it doesn't make sense. I said, it's, that's got nothing to do with it. It doesn't make sense. I says, you learn it or you'll get a low grade in history, right? He says, yeah. So you get a low grade in history. You might not get into college. This was back in 67. And, and uh, I said, you may end up in Vietnam. He said, I'll learn the presidents. <laughs> <laughs> you see... The Vietnam War, which I've been against for many, many years, and which most of you, I'm sure, are not too in favor of, uh, the Vietnam War did, did have one use. I mean, there's, uh, I mean, it was not a totally worthless war. It, it, would, it would create a certain degree of goal-oriented motivation in boy children that you just couldn't get any other way. Now, what will we use now? I don't know. I don't know. If the war really gets over, which, which it might possibly do, at least if, Let's say if it doesn't within the next week, it's not going to, but let's hope it does within the next week anyway. 
that if it really gets over, then what will we use to motivate kids? We may have to actually begin to do some of the things I'm talking about today because the, the Vietnam War, the Vietnam War just won't work, although it did work beautifully for some kids for quite a while. So that's what memorizing is all about. I was talking to a group of kids in Redwood City, California, and uh, <laughs> uh, they said, you think your kid had it rough? And I said, well, no, I mean, I'm not that rough. He said, well, in this high school, we learned the vice presidents in order. <laughs> so... Uh, you can see, someone could always out-relevance you. There's no doubt about that. Well, examine your curriculum. See what your kids are being held responsible for, the tests. The essence of the curriculum is what they're being tested on. Examine your test questions. Examine them in, in light of this new thrust around the country for accountability and behavioral objectives. And see how many of them fall into the thinking learning and memorizing category. Unfortunately, the accountability process seems to lend itself best to memorizing. That's one of the facts of life, which as educators, you'll have to resist very firmly. The presence of the United States in order is an objective which can be written down, it can be reproduced, it can be tested for, it fulfills every quality of a behavioral objective except it's insane. That's the only thing that it misses on. And after all, why let a minor thing like that get in the way of a good behavioral objective? If we write our objectives in terms of thinking and a reasonable amount of objectives in terms of learning, then this new thrust can upgrade education. But if we write them in terms of memorizing, then, of course, this will be one of the final nails into this education coffin because the kids will not really stand much more for this. The thrust to go to college is really being reduced now. The colleges are no longer in a seller's market. Kids have suddenly become aware of the fact that college is not the answer to, to all the problems of life. The Vietnam War is not going to force those who didn't want to go to college to go to college. The kids are going to look at you and say, we want education that makes some sense. We want education where we feel that to a reasonable degree, not excessive, God knows they don't want this excessively, but to a reasonable degree, we're cared about in this school and treated as human beings. These are things that it's incumbent upon educators to do. If we don't do these things, we will lose kids. We're now in a market where the children are drying up to some extent. The baby boom is over. Every time 30 kids drop out of school, a teacher's job is lost. So we have a motivation to keep these kids in school. We ought to think about this. A principal friend of mine said to his staff, and he was the one that kind of brought this home, he said to the staff, we've got to keep them in school. We're in an open enrollment area, which they happen to be in Los Angeles City. We've got to get them in our school whether they really live close or not. Because if we don't, we're going to lose teachers. And he said, I'll be the last one to go. <laughs> He says, when it's down to one room, I'll teach English and still be principal. <laughs> but but that, that's something that we have to consider. If you want to think that for some of us older folks, the survival society still is acutely with us, we ought to, we ought to think about that. Well, I kind of gave you a long, long sermon. And uh, I did it because I had a full audience. And if you, if you don't have a full audience, there's some doubts whether you should give such a long sermon like this. But it was... This was confronted with a minister down in down in Oklahoma Panhandle who had his first church. He was in this church and all excited because he would give his first sermon he'd ever given as a minister, just ordained, and he studied all week long, and he studied the night before, and he produced this tremendous sermon, and he came to church on the in the morning, and he wasn't faced with an audience like this, unfortunately. He was faced with one old rancher. That was all that was in the whole church, one guy. And he waited, and he waited, and nobody else came. And he's just terribly disappointed. He finally didn't know what to do. He went up to the old guy and he said, well, I got this sermon prepared, you know, and I'd like to give it, but, but you're the only one here. I, I don't know what to do. And, and the old rancher says, well, he says, son, I don't know much about preaching. He says, but out on the ranch, he said, when you load up a wagon load of feed and you take it out in the range and you only find one cow, you feed him. So he says, okay, all right. Went back, gave his sermon. 
gave it for an hour and a half, like I have here. Really killed the old rancher, you know, just, just killing him, you know. The guy was pulling, just writhing in his chair. Finally, when he finished, he came up to him afterwards, all excited, wanted to get a reaction. He said, well, how would you like it? The old guy pulled himself together. He says, well, son, he said, I don't know much about preaching. He says, but out on the ranch, he says, when you load up a wagon load of feed, you take it out in the range, and you find one cow, you don't feed him the whole load. <laughs> Thank you very much. Pleasure.